everybody? How are you guys doing? Good, nice, big lunch. <laughs> How's the food? Good? Food's been amazing, right? I'm stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> Should have a little aerobics routine before we start this, just to get people to shake up a little bit. That is Harris. People who saw him oh, dance yesterday would vouch for that. Yeah. So. That is coming good. <laughs> So just a quick poll here, um, how many people here have heard of or are familiar with Flask, Django, Web, Guppy, Excellent, this My is great. God. So we've got a large group here of people who are into web. So hopefully we'll have a very exciting discussion here, passionate discussion. Uh, one thing I want to mention is since we only have 45 minutes, we've also blocked out time in the open space on the first floor for four to five. So after we finish this discussion, we'll still have time in the open space to sort of dig into more details or even talk about other frameworks and anything else that we'd like to cover off, which may not happen in this 45 minutes. So let's just give it another minute. It's almost two and then we'll get started. All right, it's two o'clock, I think we're good to get started. So guys, let me quickly give you a bit of background about this panel. Uh, last year I gave a talk on Flask. Arun out here gave a talk on Django. We both had a number of questions around Flask and Django and choosing the frameworks and choices. And we thought it'd be interesting to have a healthy debate discussing a few of these frameworks and to understand some of the different trade-offs that are involved. Now, many of us are passionate about these frameworks in different ways. Although ultimately a tool is a tool, it's good to understand the nuances a little better. So we have structured this discussion in a debate format. And um, I'd like to introduce the three panelists that I have here with me. First here, this is Kiran, who is well known around here. Kiran spoke earlier yesterday. Uh, Kiran is going to be representing and evangelizing Flask. Uh, Kiran at HasGeek has been using Flask for the last several years now and catering to a fairly large user base. He's also been having a bit of a midlife crisis at Flask. So he's going to be sort of bringing up a few points where he's not as happy with Flask as well. So you'll hear a bit of that as well today. And then there's Arun, who's all about Django. He's Mr. Django. He spoke about Django last year. He spoke about Django's advanced patterns this year. And he's an industry recognized expert in Django. He's coming out with a book, which is going to be published soon on Django advanced patterns. So we're again fortunate to have him here representing Django on this panel. And finally, we have Arun Anand. Anand is representing web.py. Some of you who were here yesterday evening might have attended the uh, video on Aaron Schwartz, the story of his life. So web.py's roots, and I'll let Anand, I don't want to steal his thunder here, but Anand is a co-author of web.py, and he's collaborated from the early days with Aaron Schwartz. So here's a story I think we'll hear from someone who's been there from the early part as a co-author of web.py and currently being a, co uh, a maintainer as well of web.py. He collaborated with Aaron Schwartz on the Infogamy and Open Library. So um, that's a bit about the three of them. I'm RV. I'll be moderating the discussion. And uh, with the format, we'll go through a series of three rounds of discussion, which will hopefully cater to beginners, intermediate, and advanced users. And like I mentioned earlier, beyond that, we'll take some discussions over to uh, cover them off in the open space. Uh, so three frameworks, three evangelists, three rounds of debate. And we'll accommodate time for about three audience questions, maybe a little more time permitting. And uh, I'd encourage you, if possible, to send in questions via the hash PyCon India Twitter hashtag, if you can. If not, uh, there's Kreis and Konarak. The two of them here have coordinated to set up paper slips over here. I think there's some paper slips here. And Grace, are there, where else are they kept? All the paper slips are kept here. So if any of you would like to just put down some questions in the interest of time, just put them down in the paper slips. Grace and Konara could pick them up and then read out some of the questions toward the end during the Q&A. So don't hesitate to just come up, 
grab a slip anytime during the discussions and put them down there. Um, so with that, uh, and just, just one last little thing, we're going to do a round of voting at the end, just a little fun session of voting via a missed call voting app. You see a bit more of that at the end. So the first um, round of discussion is going to be around this question that I often hear from beginners, which is, I'm a beginner. Which framework should I start off with? Which framework should I pick to start off my project? I have a new project or a new thing that I'm trying to take up. Which one should I choose? So I'm going to start off here by asking Anand, why would you endorse web.py as being the framework that someone should choose for starting off if they're building a new app? Can you ask them? You. Okay. Yeah, um, I think of, uh, think of what PY or, uh, is uh, good for the beginners because uh, uh, it's, the learning curve is very uh, simple. It's very, uh, it's not uh, it's not difficult to learn web.py. So uh, web.py is a simple Python library. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, I mean, I would say I mean any micro framework is good for beginners. Okay. So and I think web.py is pretty good because uh, you can also develop database applications pretty easily using web.py. So, Kiran, we hear the same answer that Anand just told us about web.py about Flask all the time. Yes. So what's the difference here? Um, both of them are fairly good to start with. I would uh, put Flask as slightly better than Web.py for this, um, although this may have changed recently. Um, um, earlier, Web.py would be much easier to work with. You simply import web, and then you declare your roots, and you declare your functions, and um, you're pretty much done. Um, now, one of I have concerns with that approach because it basically treats the web module as a global for the application. I believe that's been fixed. It's a uh, it's you now create an application context, uh, which is also what you do with Flask. Uh, the thing that I think Flask has slightly better going for it uh, to start with is a decorator-based approach to declaring roots. Uh, in WebPy, you create an array of your roots and the regexes that handle these roots and so on. And that can be a little confusing once you go beyond the three or four that the example gives you. You know, the point you get to the fifth or sixth one, it's a little unclear how you're supposed to be doing this. Um, Flask. Uh, wisely enough, does not use regexes for uh, routings. It uh, basically uses slash separators, so it's able to actually sort them no matter how what order you declare them in. It will internally sort them to find the appropriate order. And so, Anand, what do you have to say to this? Uh, so, I think uh, when you look at WebPy, you understand what's going on completely. Okay, but with Flask, the creators people kind of get confused, especially for beginners. Uh, they see that like some kind of magic, you just have to put that and it works, okay. That's something I really don't uh, like very much about that, okay. When I really like the creators and number being used, it's very nice API, but especially for beginners, it's a bit confusing. Hmm. Although, I would say that for beginners, lots of things tend to be confusing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <you know. laughs> Uh, wh what's, what's important is that you have a consistent API, you know, that you know that this is exactly what it happens when you do this and that there is no magic involved in it doing something else unexpected all of a sudden. Um, and once you get past that point of comfort, then you can start digging under the hood to see how did it actually work. You know, and uh, uh, Flask routing is not trivial at all once you get under the hood. It's uh, the URL map that it uses. It's fairly complex. I've been doing Flask for about four or five years now and I still don't understand how it works. Uh, um, and I, I can tell you this because I have a bug report or something broken that uh, Armin has not been able to fix. You know, and it's been two years since I reported it. <laughs> nice. So, so Arun, do you want to jump in here? I mean, how does Django fit in this world with yeah, I mean, micro Django, around you? Django is like the elephant in the room right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, staggering to compare that. Uh, I think Django wins in a lot of areas. Documentation, it's like the most uh, well-documented web framework out there. Uh, so, so, so qualify that, because everyone here is going to say, yeah, we've got the best documentation. I mean, uh, l let me qualify that. So uh, it's going to have, uh, in terms of uh, a very good tutorial. So most of the time when you ask, OK, I want to learn X, Y, Z, where do you go to? For Django, the answer is very easy. Just go to the official tutorial, and you'll learn it. Uh, initially, it was just four parts, and I think now it's five parts, including test-driven design and all that. So I think it's very beginner-friendly, and the community is great. Uh, in fact, if you ask any 
question if you just type it on google you'll probably get the answer on stack overflow or anywhere else uh, there are about 30 odd books uh, on django uh, they tend to get outdated very fast so <laughs> that's a bit of a problem but uh, people are writing new books all the time including me of course uh, <laughs> 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 and uh, there is uh, i would say i throw this in i mean uh, th there is a lot of there are a lot of opportunities for people who learn Django in terms of uh, jobs and stuff uh, that has been increasing over the years and uh, I think there is a clear trend for uh, greater and greater jobs so if you're a beginner and you want to focus on something probably that's one criteria you can criteria. think about. Yeah. It's interesting someone on Twitter Arunatma said same site goal by Kiran and debate goal for web.py so uh, any comments that you want to quickly chime in on with uh, respect to Django? Repeat the question. Uh, someone on Twitter Arunatma has said same site goal by Kiran and debate goal for web.py Oh yeah, he basically means that I'm bitching, you know, bitching about flash quality. I'm, there's plenty of bitching about flash coming up, okay? <laughs> so, so I would like to add one thing as well. Uh, back in 2006 or 2007, I was really desperately looking to land a uh, web frame uh, program uh, using Python, okay? So I went and attended uh, a training session on uh, Zope and, uh, Zope and Plo, and I'm just Sit, I sat through three days and I couldn't get anything out of it. Okay. I understand. And then uh, I looked at what else I can do. When I looked at the Django, I started trying to learn Django. I mean, it takes so long time to actually get started on something. Okay. And that was, it was that time when Aaron Chaudhary used web.py and I tried writing a program and said, ah, I mean, that's so simple to use. Okay. That's how I got hooked in web.py. Great. So, what do you guys think? <laughs> 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 Little confused? Well, it felt like they were saying the same things on a few points, but differing a little on different points, right? But so let's just step on a little more and see how things get a little more interesting for people who have been using some of these frameworks for a little bit. Your code base evolved. It's kind of nice. You've got a small micro framework. Things get harder. When things are not opinionated, it gets a little more complex. So let's say it's someone who's built slightly complex sites or backends, right? And they want to know, how do you architect and design your apps as they get more complex? And why is your framework best suited for someone whose app is either gaining complexity or someone who's trying to build a new app which is slightly complex. And I'm going to start here with Kiran. Okay. So one of the things that uh, Flask acquired slightly more recently is this concept called a blueprint where you separate out part of your functionality into something that's not quite an app but behaves a lot like an app. And you can plug it into an app and you can reuse it across modules and so on. Um, and uh, I've been using that quite a bit to restructure a lot of my apps into um, multi-component pieces where you can optionally turn off a component that you don't want at runtime you know and just say just don't report that if you don't want it so um, if you guys have been looking at the last user code since yesterday's talk it's basically built as a collection of three blueprints um, I like the approach it makes it really easy to uh, modularize your code and uh, the other thing is that uh, flask is um, fairly um, hands-off when it comes to telling you how to structure your code so you evolve your own conventions after a while. You know, I have one, I have now a skeleton that I use across all my projects and that's something that is a skeleton I've evolved <coughs> after realizing that this works for me and for the kind of apps that I write. But this is not a skeleton that Flask gives you. Um, it's not like Django where you make a project and the project then has an outline ready made for you. You know, in this case you do it yourself. And you get all the flexibility you want when you're doing something like this. Yeah, uh, regarding blueprints, we have been having that in Django for a couple of t years now, so we call it apps. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that the flask is ca catching up. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, to the second point, I'd like to say that uh, it's good that you have evolved your own style, but uh, mm -hmm. how about handing it over to another developer? I mean, if, when it comes to Django projects, it's very easy to find out. For example, there is an exception at accounts.views. something, mm -hmm. and Immediately a Django developer understands that, okay, accounts is the app, views is the model view controller view, mm. and uh, there is no need to really explain what it is. So mm. uh, when you roll your own, that comes with the problems of, you know, understanding what your design decisions were. Yes, and uh, when somebody rolls it for you, then you have no control over it, and that's uh, even <laughs> more problematic. Okay. <laughs> no, I think uh, uh, it, it's, it, it, that's the trade-off we are talking about here. So. Uh, when you start a Django project, uh, it's already built for scale. So it's like uh, you're already talking about models being separated from views, being separated from templates. Mm. I mean, I built a Twitter clone in a bottle. Uh, 
and I thought it was great until I started writing hundreds and hundreds of lines of code and it's like a nightmare to you know organize it but it's not really a problem when it comes to Django because you know where things go it's like a kitchen shelf where everything is neatly labeled and you know you just have to put things in the right place that's all you have to worry about all so right so Anand do you want to throw the kitchen sink at this yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Vopa is not a framework it's a library <laughs> Okay, so it doesn't let you. It doesn't ask you how. It doesn't tell you how you should do things. Okay, it tells you those are the tools that you want to uh, that you can use uh, in writing your application. Okay, so as so a one thing about uh, uh, Django and uh, also slightly Flask is the kind of uh, 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 there are ways of doing things. You should do. I mean, uh, uh, this is the way to do uh, X and this is the way to do Y. Okay, but with Webpack, there's just set of tools that you can use to build your stuff. Okay, so when you're building uh, uh, slightly large applications, it's all about your discipline how you want to do this stuff. Any thoughts on that you'd like to add, Kiran? Yeah, it's more about what kind of application you're building. If it's like a web server embedded inside your huge application, then probably you don't need to worry too much about you know uh, the model view controller separation and stuff like that so I'll call them toy examples if you <laughs> like to say it I mean it's it's more like a simple uh, thing which can fit in a couple of lines so in the Ruby on Rails world they have this thing called Sinatra which uh, you know it, it's it's very easy to read uh, in fact even the HTML code the CSS everything is a part of one file and if you are really having a web application that's just fits two screens or three screens uh, then you probably would like to go for a library approach. You don't really require a framework. Hmm. Well, uh, Can I? Yeah, yeah so uh, I'm not saying WebPy doesn't give you anything. Okay, so it has database module. You can keep your database things separately. It has templating engine. Okay, so you have all these things. Okay, but uh, it doesn't uh, enforce you that you have a view.py, you have notice.py, you have something. And that, uh, that's the way you structure your code. Okay. But you still uh, can structure your code in all those ways, and it has tools for doing it. And Anand, do you want to comment about ORMs? I think this is a very opinionated topic. Yeah. So, well, uh, so I, I should go first before this. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to use Web.py before Flask, and I still have production software running on Web.py. I stopped using it because of the ORM, or the lack of one. So, okay. so, <laughs> um, so I've tried to use SQL Alchemy so many times and then failed. Okay. Uh, it's so hard to uh, get something started, at least. Probably have not uh, smart enough to get it. But uh, uh, modesty there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, really, I mean, I played so many times and then gave up. Okay. So I find it very hard. Uh, uh, one thing. The second thing is uh, uh, with WebPy, you write SQL. Okay. You talk to database in the database language. With SQL Alchemy, you write. You talk to database in SQL Alchemy language. Okay. And That's the true man. You can write SQL in SQL Alchemy, it's perfectly happy to accept it. <laughs> well, so, uh, so yeah, again, it's hard to, for me to ask. Uh, I updated the SQL Alchemy version and then started filing. Okay, because... Uh, it's many to many mapping or something. They have changed something. Yeah, so, uh, okay, well, what I want to say is when something fails in SQL Alchemy, you know SQL Alchemy stack trace. You don't know what's wrong with your query. Mm. It's very like hard to fix. I'd like to pitch into that. Uh, uh, probably SQL Alchemy is the best ORM among the three. I mean, it can handle multiple databases very well, legacy databases very well. But it's damn hard to use, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's a tank. Yeah, it's a tank, right? <laughs> so uh, Django ORM goes for the middle approach. I mean, uh, it doesn't try to do everything for you. You'll have to step down to SQL when it comes to complex queries. But for those 80-20 principle people, it's the 80% use cases which are handled by the Django ORM very well. And for 20% of cases, you, you always have SQL. You can step down to ROS. So on that, here's a question from Twitter a couple of people have asked, which is, how does Django play with NoSQL databases? Because it's often perceived to not play well. A couple of you guys have asked that. Why don't you answer that, Arun? Yeah, I mean, it's not one of its strengths. But uh, see, uh, the, the way Django is designed is that it has to have a database built in, I mean, specified in the settings. So uh, you can't use a NoSQL database there. You have to go with something. Uh, but having said that, there are a lot of Django projects which uses Redis, MongoDB, or even the Google Bigtable and things like that. So it's not impossible. It's just a matter of 
uh, not being uh, the philosophy with which it was built for. Built for. So it was built then for relational databases. Yeah, I would say. It and is. how's its performance with relational databases? Uh, what What would you say about that? I mean, uh, again, it was built specifically for PostgreSQL, right? So that's where the best performance you'll get extract out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 coming to the specific question of performance, yeah. it has uh, powered one of the largest sites. Uh, it it is the backend behind Discuss, which is a real-time commenting engine. Yep. It is the backend behind Instagram. So I don't think uh, you will reach a point where you'll uh, be suffocated by the performance issues. And do you guys want to chime in, Anand and Kiran, about performance of your? I, I'm not sure that's uh, entirely uh, true because um, Jacob Kaplan Mas is known to use SQL Alchemy when Django ORM doesn't work for him, and he's a guy who created Django ORM and he admits this publicly. Right. So, if the creator of Django ORM says it's not good enough for him, it certainly is not good enough for the rest of the world. Hmm? Uh, come on. <laughs> well, I would say ORM is not good enough for anybody. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> ORM is a leaky abstraction, right? There is no yeah. perfect ORM which can replicate every SQL scenario. At right. the end of the day, there will be some 10% scenario where you have to step down to SQL. Yeah, so th this is the part where I really like working with SQL Alchemy because it's not a framework, it's a library to use a cliche. <laughs> SQL Alchemy lets you work at the high level, you want to use ORM, use it, you want to work, draw a SQL, use it, you want to use SQL constructs as functions and basically build a query out of it, you use that. And the best part is that internally everything works the same way. If you talk to the high level API, internally it talks to the low level API. So you can bypass the high level API, talk to the low level API and you get back a result object exactly as you would if you talk to the high level API. And that's beautiful because it basically means that I do not have to worry about saying I am going to actually ignore all of this and go talk raw database and then deal with raw data coming back from the database. You don't have to worry about that. It comes back the way you expect it to even if you had used a high level API. Um, and that's an advantage that I have not seen in any other library. That's uh, This is basically what makes SQL Alchemy's learning curve so high because uh, there are a lot of times you will find yourself saying that you want to step down into something a little deeper and you will have to figure out how to get to the deeper path because um, SQL Alchemy's documentation is endless. I've never ever had to look at SQL Alchemy's source code to figure out how anything works. Everything that you want to know is in the documentation. If it's not in the documentation, go to Stack Overflow. Michael Bayer himself will come and answer your question for you. Um, and that's remarkable. You know, I've never seen um, a project owner that open to answering any kind of question that anybody throws him at any public forum. Um, and in general, there is always an answer with SQL Alchemy. Uh, Anand, you've yeah. been waiting to say something here, so I should take <laughs> over. And that works. So, the issue is, uh, uh, you have to define your table schema. It's gone off. It's off. Yeah. Uh, uh, it works in theory, but not in practice. Can you change this mic? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying it works in theory, but not in practice uh, because uh, you have to define your table schema. So, uh, I recently uh, started the SQL Alchemy project and decided I want to add a JSON type. Uh, so, since it uh, uh, loads, when you do uh, select something on a table, uh, it tries to get everything, okay. So, it fails somewhere else because it, it doesn't know how to convert JSON to something else. You can fix the problem. I you, can, so I'm it can, it can, you can fix it, okay. So, the thing is, the problem is not with SQL. Okay, so I really want to fail. If I fail, I won't fail in SQL and I can fix my yeah, query. So okay. the, you can fix it as a part of the standard API because this is one of the things that most people stumble upon the first time they use SQL Alchemy. If you do not want to load a column, you simply declare yeah. it. That's so that's so one. Would I really say it's beginner friendly? I mean, it's not. It's most certainly not beginner friendly, that's for sure. Uh, so one problem with SQL Alchemy is it, it makes you feel stupid. Every time I get something, it makes me feel stupid because it, uh, I get in some trouble about it every time. Also, have you ever tried? Uh, cache in SQL, uh, work with caching in SQL Alchemy. Yeah. How hard it is? It's, it's documented. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, it's again making me feel stupid. <laughs> so, I, um, I wrote a small uh, caching library for an app that I built. Okay. It took me 40 lines of code. It cached everything, all the database results. Now, I'm building the, uh, building the app again. I thought, uh, let me try using Flask in SQL Alchemy. Okay. Now I have no clue how hard it's to uh, build caching for it. So it's not obvious how to do this because this is the part where you start to get intimate, intimately familiar with SQL Alchemy's internals. Um, mind you, without ever reading the SQL Alchemy source code, you know, I've never done that. I've, um, there was only one point where I had a moment of weakness and I'm trying to figure out something that's not in the API, but I wanted to know how it works. So I went to look at the code and I came away enlightened for that. And now I use that pattern in my code as well. But uh, in general, 
I have found an answer to any kind of problem I have ever had in SQL Alchemy by just looking at the documentation. It's all there. It just is just so intense. It's like a book. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Just to quickly move on to a couple of the questions that are coming on Twitter. A few people have asked about how your frameworks deal with enabling people to build REST-based backends. And uh, um, question. yeah, why don't you jump in quickly? Yeah, I think uh, Django REST framework is considered to be a gold standard when it comes to uh, how well it models a problem domain which is like models and it maps very correctly to the API. So uh, at the end of the day, we are all talking about SQL and all that, but I think we should talk about Pythonic code. And uh, uh, when it comes to Django, they are trying to create as simple Python objects as possible, I mean Python syntax as possible. Uh, there was a, a branch called removing the magic in which they removed all the magic from Django. Uh, so I, I would consider Rails to have a lot of magic, but Django is very simple, straightforward Python code. Uh, if you create a Python class uh, which declares, uh, every, I mean, declaratively specifies your uh, database schema, uh, you're good. You're, you can actually create REST APIs out of it. You can create forms out of it. You can create generic views out of it. Great. So you're saying Django provides much better support for people building REST APIs. It's opinionated in some ways, but things are well documented. It's very Pythonic. It's I mean, very Pythonic. The novel and dictator's life has blessed Battery Django. So among the web frameworks, uh, I don't know if his opinion still holds good. He said about three years back that Django is the preferred, I mean, Guido prefers Django as the web framework. Web framework. So Anand, what about web.py and REST? How is it? So, uh, so uh, uh, one of the testimonials of Web.py is with uh, Django, you write web application in Django. With, with Web.py, you write in Python. Okay. So uh, it doesn't come on your way at all. Just a library. Just like you import uh, any other Python library, you import OSS, you import web, and start working. Okay. That's, I mean, it's, it's as natural as that. Yeah, but what about building larger applications? I mean, how, how, how does that scale? A bit... Uh, I mean, uh, I think I've been building pretty large website to prepare. I don't think I have any issues in the sense. Okay. Because that is one thing I want to talk about in the first round. Like, uh, I mean, uh, there are a lot of beginners out there who think that uh, it's great to learn a micro framework and start writing code and understand the entire flow. So I understand in Django, it's not very easy to understand where the flow of control flows. But since it's spread out over a lot of files, uh, but it actually helps you all the way till the end. I mean, t building a production site. For example, I have struggled a lot with uh, uh, SQL injection problems and all sorts of security problems because uh, I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I was, you know, simply getting user input and mm. I was just trying to put in a database yeah. by using yeah. SQL. But it so happens that doing that is a very, very bad thing. You, you should not use user input directly into your database or into your templates, so on and so forth. So all those good stuff is already baked, baked in, inside. so you don't make those mistakes. So, guys, tell me one thing. So, like, with something like Django, which has been around for a while, appears to have a sizable community. When you're growing your app and you start to have a large team around it, there's the argument that with Django, it's easier to find new developers, bring them into a project at any point, plus mm. there's an existing batteries included platform you're working with, whereas with micro frameworks like Flask or Web.py, where in your case, Kiran, you build up a lot of boilerplate on top of that to support a bunch of things. Yeah. Then you get a bunch of new people into your team and they have no idea because things are different. How mm. do you deal with that with a micro framework or even a library like you call Web.py? So, um, in general, uh, no matter what you do, you, you will have an you know onboarding process for anybody who comes on board. Um, and um, I don't think any of us has a corporate environment where it's onboarding free. Um, you have to onboard a new person, not just for the framework, but for your own code. You know, the code that you have may be IP, may be um, not public, um, which is the case for most of us. And therefore, you don't even have an option to show them the code and how it works until they come on board. You, know, you can't do this before the join. Arun, what do you have to say about that? I think Django really wins on this because uh, it's very easy to uh, get people uh, who are trained on Django as well as understand the source code. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there, are, there was a lacuna when it came to large projects which are implemented in Django. But uh, python.org, the official Python website, is open source now and it's a Django project. So anybody who wants to see how a large Django project is implemented can just go and see that. So. Uh, uh, you'll find that it's very uh, uh, comparable to the initial Django project that you create and the large Django projects which are out there. And Anand, in this context, we're talking about a library here. So much more boilerplate on top. With a large team, how would you manage that? Oh, 
I really don't have an answer for this because uh, I've not worked with any large team with the Bradley Y. All right, I'll, I'll treat there as a white flag being raised there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So with this, I just want to step forward to look at the future. Like a few questions that people in the audience have asked is, what about Pyramid? What about other frameworks that are out there? So I just want to step forward. I mean, these are the guys out there who are saying, no, I'm too cool for these kids using Django and Flask. I'm on Pyramid or I'm on Tornado or Twisted. You guys are out there. I've seen the tweets. I know it. So for you guys out here, I want to sort of just look at the future for a minute here. And I'd like you guys to talk through, and you don't need to support just your framework. Feel free mm -hmm. to talk about what you think the future, future might be. Which frameworks do you think have the most promising future, given the direction of Python, Async, REST, WebSockets, other things that are happening out there? Mm -hmm. And what else do you see that's out there that's emerging that people might need to start to look out for or watch out for? Inside of Python. Inside of Python. So with Python, I think um, if we look at the cleanest architecture for any uh, framework, it's Pyramid. Um, it's a pity that not enough people use Pyramid. And one of the reasons uh, Pyramid is so good and so complicated is that it's like SQL Alchemy. It gives you everything. It's up to you to decide which parts you actually want to use. And that's uh, a little too overwhelming for a lot of people you know, to start with. But Pyramid is a lot more loosely coupled than Django is. In Django, you get a lot of things that you may or may not want to use. For instance, Django templates for a very long time were known to be really poor at performance and uh, Jinja 2 was created by someone very upset at Django templates performance and it's been a while until Jinja 2 became the standard templating system in Django if I'm right that's what it is now. No it's not. It's not here it's an option. You can memory. replace it. Yeah. Exactly so it's it's you one of the things you deal with when Django is you get all of these parts and you do not always want them and then it's a lot of work taking them out of Django and saying I don't want to use this particular part of it. Pyramid on the other hand is very nicely designed it's uh, also um, and this is a, one of the advantages that Pyramid has is that the person maintaining it, Chris McDonough, does this full time for a living. Uh, with Flask on the other hand, Armin is not a Flask developer full time. He works at a game development studio. His life passion at this point is making games, not maintaining Flask. And this shows in the maintenance quality of Flask that it may be beautifully designed but it's, it's got a maintainer who basically is interested in doing this on his weekends, not as a day job. Probably I should say that it was started as an April Fool's joke, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so for something that started as an April Fool's joke, it is remarkably solid. Yeah. Um, it's simply got a maintainer problem. People took it seriously, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you think, Anand? <laughs> yeah, uh, coming back to uh, the problems of Django. So there is a real effort to remove all the uh, non-essential parts out of Django. So comments have been removed. A lot of things which are not essential to Django are, if you know Django, it's called contrib. So a lot of things will be removed in the future as well. The maintainer has explicitly stated that hopefully not admin, which is considered to be a USP, but a uh, lot of things which are non-essential will be removed as external libraries, which you can optionally use. And uh, the future of Django is more in terms of uh, how people define it. Um, I actually wrote an article about, I was totally wowed by Meteor and JavaScript. So I thought async is going to be the future of web development, right? So everything is going the async way. But, uh, and Python has this real problem of WSGI, which is underlying for all three of us right here, right? So WSGI is the underlying thing which works in the bottom. And WSGI is not really designed for async uh, programming. But uh, uh, Guido is working really hard on that. He's trying to create, I mean, Python 3 is uh, effort towards that direction. So I, I believe, uh, Python really, uh, Python web frameworks in general need to start thinking in terms of uh, asynchronous programming. Uh, of course, for the majority of the sites you get to build, they are not the cool sites, right? I mean, there are the CRUD sites, which are the majority of the work we do. And they are actually require some kind of synchronous programming just to keep yourself sane. You know, uh, asynchronous programming can get really complex to fit in your brain. But uh, most of the time you find that uh, there is a real real-time application need for every application, for every use case you built. Even a social network like Facebook, uh, suddenly when a pop comes up, a notification comes up, that makes the experience so much richer. Right. And everybody can do that. So on this, do you see more people moving away from necessarily using the delayed worker architecture, which we currently use, the Celery or RQ, yeah. to maybe using, you know, this is other assembly language of the web-based framework, which lets you do everything async. Right. Uh, is it likely we'll... I think WebSockets and... 
technologies like that changed everything. So earlier it was a polling based uh, technology and everything was synchronous actually behind the hood. But now we have real async. So uh, uh, like you rightly pointed out, Celery is an asynchronous queue, but it's not really happening in the request response cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a real rethink from ground up how we can handle the request response cycle bidirectionally, especially when it's coming back when you actually send something. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'd actually be interested in seeing um, uh, approaches like Celery and RQ given less priority than they have right now because um, Celery and RQ can bring in their own um, idiosyncrasies to your project that can catch you by surprise because you don't you don't you're not affected by the monthly end production and then it becomes much harder to figure out what just happened and why did this thing stop working um, it'll be nicer to have a sync within a request response cycle instead of pushing it outside because that gives it that puts it in a place where it's much easier to debug when something goes wrong and is it easier to debug because if you look at the other side of the world outside of python where these guys are running these apps yeah. in that assembly language of the web thing they constantly have to restart the servers because of all those issues they have running everything in the request cycle. Yeah, so I would say more than that, it's uh, easier to put this into a development environment uh, for a simple reason that, you know, I use RQ a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, to run one of my apps, I need to run at least four processes mm -hmm. to deal with the various aspects of this process. And uh, that just makes it harder for me to work because I'm constantly tempted to say, if I need to fix something and I'm right now not in my development environment, mm -hmm. then I'm going to not bother running all the four servers to make sure that the patch I made just works. Yeah. I'm just going to assume that I know how to write without writing a typo and push right. it straight to production and let production deal with the breakdown. Right. Basically and too many moving parts. Okay. Too many moving parts, exactly. And occasionally right. production breaks down because I did make a mistake. So just one last question. If you guys had to place a bet on a framework for the future, which one would it be? It doesn't need to be any of the ones that you're endorsing. If you had to pick one, or is it something which you think has not yet emerged? So I would I'll let Anand go first, Anand. Uh, I don't think I have an opinion on that, so <laughs> let uh, sure. uh, okay. Karen go on that. Sure. So I'm going to put this between uh, as a race between Pyramid and Flask. Flask okay. wins because it has much cleaner documentation, much easier for anyone to figure out how to do things. Pyramid wins simply because it has better maintainers. Sure. How about you, Anand? I'll put it on Django, obviously, because <laughs> 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 not because I'm talking about it, but uh, because of the community. Because if you look at wha how what is the success behind Python, Python is by no means the best programming language in the world, but I believe it is one of the best programming language communities. Yeah. So uh, I think that is a strength behind Django as well. So uh, a lot of criticism, I, I didn't address that directly, it, uh, is directed at what comes with uh, Django. But uh, Pyramid goes for the best of breeds approach and Django comes with batteries included approach. Included right? as well. But it's not necessarily true, right? You can remove some of the batteries sure. and put in whatever you like. It's incredibly flexible that way. In fact, at DjangoCon, they did that. So, you're about to add something. Yeah. So, uh, it's nice thing that well, the good thing about Python is community, but also there's one more nice thing about Python is uh, uh, learning Python is very easy and it's incremental. I mean, you can start learning at the basics and then you can go deep, dive deep as long as you want. Okay. And I think that's uh, true again with web.py, but not other frameworks. So, it's pretty hard to uh, get a grip of what actually happening inside, inside. with other frameworks. But WebPy is very simple to simple understand to what's that happening that. inside. And I have to just add in here that I ended up looking at some code, uh, the code behind Python Express, which all you guys are familiar with, Anand is a vision, is initiative which he's pushed along. I ended up looking at it to push a little, uh, I sent in a pull request with a little fix. It took me very little time to figure out Anand's code using web.ly and jump in there. So, so guys, impressed yet? Yes? No? Yeah? So ultimately, right, one thing we want to bring out here is the whole objective of this thing here is to show you that frameworks are ultimately a tool and to bring out the nuances of the choices. And there's no right answer one way or the other. I do want to sort of open this out now, however, for audience voting. And uh, these are the three numbers that you can call. And hopefully my network is going to hold out and we can see something live here. Oh, hang on, numbers. sorry, just a second. Whoops, there you go. So I'll just read out the numbers as well, just so you guys can hear me. Uh, if it's Flask, call 080-3075-2691. Last digits 2692 for Django and 2693 for web.py. The phone will ring three, four times and it will hang up automatically. You will not be charged for this call. Okay? <laughs> You're not going to be charged for the call. It's just a missed call. The phone will ring three, four times and then it will hang up automatically. 
I think we should clarify that just because you have already checked out something doesn't mean that you don't want to check it out again, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just clarifying the question. <laughs> yeah, and I hope the networks. Oh. All right. Okay. So, voting's done. We'll do one thing. I'll just quickly open up the craze to bring up QA quickly. Meanwhile, you guys can continue to vote. Chris, do you want to just bring up questions meanwhile and I'll try to fix the network? No questions specifically? Cool. Yes. How do speeds and overheads compare for the free framework? Speed of rendering the Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, when you say speed, uh, rendering, uh, definitely, like Kiran said, uh, of there are certain uh, template libraries which are faster than uh, Django's default template library like Jinja. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I, and uh, when it comes to ORMs, uh, it's your... Sorry. Over overheads. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about the ORM overhead. So uh, it's not necessarily a big overhead uh, in that. But uh, what is generally seen or what we generally advise to people is uh, the web framework overhead is very minimal. It's usually the I.O. part which is more intensive. It's every web application is more I.O. intensive. And that's usually the slowest part. And the overhead that a framework gives is much minimal. That's why you can build large sites with your, a complete framework like Django. So to add to that point, you know, um, I would say that the overhead you deal with are one year ORM. How quickly can it load from the database? And this comes down to basically your database architecture. If the cleaner it is, the faster it's going to load. Um, and sometimes a clean architecture in your database is not a clean URL because I for one for instance never have primary keys in the URLs um, because I think primary keys are internal data they should never be put out in the public but if you're having something else then that something else has to be looked up in the database and that could be an overhead so there's a, there's a design problem that affects your overhead one second there's a uh, security problem you want to make sure this person K is supposed to see what he's supposed to be seeing or supposed to perform an action. Now, how you design your security architecture could be an overhead. And this is not a framework thing. Now, this comes down to how you want to do it. Okay? And the third thing is your template rendering language. In which case, Flask clearly wins. It just got the better one. Yeah. It is, it's a full URL. Yeah, Mic's not on. Yes. And yet I found that in case of class extensions, they are quite open-ended. Open-ended. Yeah. And several, uh, and also, uh, some class extensions require another extension to work correctly. Yes. Uh, in case of, say, class SQL Alchemy, uh, it kind of uh, wraps the API of SQL Alchemy and tries to make it very close to what Django is. Yeah, but you don't have to use that. Yeah, of course. That's offline. Okay, so let's be clear about this. It does not wrap the API of SQL Alchemy in any way. All it does is links it to the session request so that when the request starts in Flask, a session is open in SQL Alchemy. That's all it does. And it also proxies all the, you don't need to import from That's just an import. That's an import shortcut. It does not do anything to actually affect the way SQL Alchemy itself works. Yeah, so that extension does not bother me as much as something like the WT Forms extension does, which is not only open it, it also changes API without warning. Okay, so um, I've had enough pain with that that I've stopped using that one. Okay, um, but the Flask SQL Alchemy, on the other hand, is very, very nice because it solves one very specific problem, which is opening a database connection when the request opens, closing it when the request closes, and nothing else. It gets out of the way for everything else. Okay. Yeah. Just moving on to the last couple of questions from Twitter. I've been able to weave, thank you guys for posting questions via Twitter. I think I was able to weave in most of those questions into the discussion, which is great. Uh, I'm just going to quickly cover off the results. Unfortunately, the net's down. But here are the final numbers that I have. We have in, in third place is web.py with 13 votes, 1-3. So guys, please give a hand. I think people are going to try. So I'm sure you guys are waiting to know. <laughs> Flask versus Django. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Raise hands, raise hands. Flask! So... PHP! <laughs> <laughs> so maybe more...
<laughs> so, France came in at 29 votes, Django 48. <laughs> so guys, just the last couple of questions, we've handled most of the questions that came in via Twitter. There's just a uh, last few up here that I'm going to quickly bring up. So Kushal is asking, just using the Django URM, ORM, will do too many queries, is it true? Well, again, uh, there's no right answer to that. It depends on how you uh, design your uh, queries. Uh, in case you find that you're resulting in too many queries, uh, I didn't understand the question because one o one function actually results in a one. when I'm using a normal, simple, uh, just hello world kind of application or wiki, right. I use the Django RM, right. 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 No, that is because uh, there are a lot of things which comes built into Django, right? Sessions or users and things like that. That that adds to the additional database calls. Otherwise, user error. Sorry. User error. Yeah, I mean, just uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just eliminate that. I mean, you, it's not necessary that you have to. Well, it's it, so it, 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 you have a powerful weapon. Don't blow your leg off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly why you see SQL alchemy. I know exactly what it's doing. I don't know. I would say uh, that's what, the reason why I use web by database because I exactly know how many database calls make. Yeah. Uh, okay. How, how many times are you going to do SQL injection attack by checking in, in web by because it's it Past to it. Guys, clearly these days could go on and on, right? <laughs> now, now, I was just want to mention, we're going to continue this, okay? To dive into this a little more and talk about other frameworks, maybe we'll, you know, we'll talk a bit about PHP too, we'll see. But we'll talk a little more about pyramids with other frameworks, 4 to 5, 4 to 445, in the open space up on the first floor. So those of you interested, if you love this, please stop by at 4. Uh, thank you so much, Kiran, who got volunteered in a little bit, Arun <laughs> and Anand. Amazing discussion. Please give them a big hand. Thank you guys so much. So, um, if any of you guys are interested, I'd like to show you a code sample and I want to see how you would do this in either Django or in Let's see if you can replicate it. <laughs> yeah, sure.